It is the degree to which black people have been systemically denied opportunities that other people can take for granted. And as long as we deny the lethal limits that are imposed upon black American folk or black folk more broadly, as a result of the very identities we speak about, then those identities have to be taken into account. If your visceral sense of what voting is supposed to be about is sticking your thumb down against white hegemony. It can distract us from, frankly, the less theatrical sorts of things that really can make a massive difference. I think that it makes us not have as much imagination as we might always have in trying to make Black lives better. Hello and welcome to Intelligence Squared. I'm your debate host and referee, John Donvan. And today I am asking this question. Is the appeal to identity politics a way to win elections? Does such a focus serve beneficially to organize and mobilize citizens whose interests and very presence in politics tends to get marginalized? Or does it miss the point that each voter is an individual and membership in a group is but one and not always the most important consideration in who that person will vote for? On the one hand, today we have the most diverse Congress in American history. But on the other, we saw President Trump netting record numbers of minority voters in the election that we just come through. So what do those outcomes tell us about identity politics and whether appealing to them is a winning strategy or not? Well, that's what we're going to debate with two gentlemen who have spent a lot of time thinking about this issue and, in fact, debating each other in the past on a variety of topics. I want to welcome them both first now. Uh, Professor John McWhorter is an author and contributing writer at The Atlantic and a professor at Columbia University. John, thank you for joining us and welcome back to Intelligence Squared. My pleasure. And opposing you will be Dr. Michael Eric Dyson of Vanderbilt University. He is a New York Times contributing opinion writer and a contributing editor at The New Republic. Michael, thanks so much for joining us again at Intelligence Squared. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me. Just before we get started, I just want to ask each of you a very, very simple question, which I think will give us some indication of where you're going to argue on the central question. And that question to you is, I'll start with you, John McWhorter. What does the term identity politics evoke for you? The way we use the word identity today is not something that someone 50 years ago would have recognized. Rather, when we say identity, it's a shorthand for how a non-white person feels in relation to a white hegemony. That's what we mean by identity. And identity politics proposes that all people who are not roughly white Americans will see themselves primarily as that not white person in an eternal kind of conflict with the powers that be who are white. That is what we mean by identity in 2020. Thank you. And Michael, the same question to you. What does the term identity politics evoke for you? Well, for me, it evokes a history of the undifferentiated mass of white identity seen as universal. Since whiteness has signified and symbolized Uh, a a strictly universal conception of self, um, anything that departs from that was seen as a kind of uh, identitarian bete noir. It was offensive and it was in some instances, most instances, inauthentic. So when I hear identity politics, I hear uh, the, for the first time, uh, a constructive engagement with identities that fall outside the parameter of the hegemonic white identity that has often been identified as the universal identity and therefore shorn of its ethnicity and race and articulated as an ideal that is adhered to by everybody. And those who don't uh, are uh, unfortunately and tragically seen as somehow doing the wrong thing. All right. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, John, for for giving us a little bit of an insight about how you're going to argue uh, the question that's the central question of this debate. And it's whether the appeal to identity politics is a winning strategy. John McWhorter, are you yes or no on that question? I would have to say no. Okay. And what's your argument? Go for it. My argument would be that the idea that to be a person who's not white is to primarily think of oneself as not white and as not being seen fully by white people is something that can seem very normal to you know college town hyper educated people like us but i think that it's much less normal than we often think i think that we pointy headed people tend to 
overstate and to exaggerate the extent to which a person who is not white needs to be seen fully by those who are in power in order to achieve or even to feel good about themselves. And so, of course, what we've seen in the past election results is what from the academia slash mainstream media slash wokester perspective looks bizarre, which is that more than a few black and brown people happily voted for Donald Trump, who is clearly, and there's no no dispute here, he is clearly a casual bigot in the Archie Bunker sense. I am quite sure that Donald Trump does not see me fully, that he wouldn't if he met me. That is certainly true. But that is not the mic drop disqualifier for for a vote of as many black and brown people as we might think. And most importantly, the people who voted for him were by no means all bow-tied conservative types who are in some kind of question as to whether or not they really belong to the black or the Latino race. You can see that a great many of the people who voted for Donald Trump, for whatever their reasons, and I was not one of them, but for whatever their reasons, were people who nobody could say were not authentically black or brown culturally. So I think we just need to open ourselves up to the idea that identity politics may be one strategy that somebody might espouse and to make coherent and sustained arguments for, but it is not universal and unquestioned morality itself. It's one way of looking at things that's popular, especially among a certain type of person, usually highly educated and concentrated in cities and college towns. All right, Michael. So the way that we've set this up as um, uh, a dichotomy, uh, basically, if uh, John is arguing against this, uh, is arguing no on this question, you are the yes. So why... Please make your case on why appealing to identity politics can be a winning strategy. Sure. I suspect that, uh, you know, John and I have overlapping interests and arenas of agreement, as well as dispute and disagreement if we were to have a Venn diagram. But since we're heading for uh, or aiming for a far more um, linear or at least uh, discrete sphere of engagement, I'll say yes. Um, Look. When we talk about identity, what has always interested me is that in the modern West and even in the ancient uh, European cultures, for that matter, uh, identity was not necessary to be articulated because it was the common presumption of those uh, who participated in the culture, in the race, in the ethos, in the ethnos, Uh, those who were capable and competent as citizens of a defined region or group of political interests um, had laid out for them a set of expectations, a set of norms, a set of ideals, and a set of practices, habits, and dispositions in an Aristotelian sense that constituted the virtue of their identities. But those identities need not be articulated against the backdrop of an offending or a dissenting uh, reality, not to suggest that there were no uh, catastrophic and cataclysmic differences that were being unleashed on particular individuals or communities, and against which they had to assert a kind of uh, collective and homogenous self-conception in order to offer self-defense. What I am saying, however, is that in the way we mean it in the modern sense of identity politics, Uh, ably uh, stipulated uh, to a degree by Professor McWhorter. Um, The thing is, is that, look, the Greeks, the Romans, the Italians, the Jews, the Irish, the Polish, you know, folk all have had identities, but in subsuming those identities under, say, more an ethnic or a a national identity, um, it was not necessary to articulate a specific racial conception of self that was brought into existence when uh, the powers, the ingenuities, and the intelligences of Europe are sharply juxtaposed to those who fall outside of its circumference and its realm. So whether it's Africa or parts of Asia and the like. And so in our modern day, when we think about identity politics, You know, the complaint is, look, why can't we be unified? After all, the motto of the country is e pluribus unum, out of many one. Why can't we forge a kind of common destiny 
um, where we're able to generate uh, a unified conception, not not uniformity, but unified that says all of those differences can be brought together and reasonably coherent, made reasonably coherent under the same umbrella. And that sounds like an ideal to which many of us should aspire. But the problem is that in uh, our modern conception, identity politics is really the default position of those who have been white, those who have been in the dominant culture, and those who don't fit into that mode are seen as somehow less than, inferior to, or estranged from uh, an ideal that has been articulated as normative and universal. But the problem is the universal and the normative really is a default position for whiteness. Whiteness hasn't been outed as one among many other ethnic and racial uh, aggregations and identities. And as a result of that, uh, whiteness looks identity less and black and brown and red and yellow and indigenous and all the others look like they are carrying the banner of a kind of ethnosauric identity, right? Outmoded, outdated uh, ethnosaurs, dinosaurs of ethnicity and race that really don't comport well with a modern conception of a multivariegated, multi-hued, very complicated uh, collection of different peoples. And why, after all, should we make identity the premise of our engagement with society and the basis of our citizenship. And I think the problem is that once whiteness gets dethroned as the de facto head, you know, the head identity in charge, all the others uh, begin to challenge it. And those who are defensive on the, on the white side or the dominant side, look at everybody else and think, oh, you're not playing the game fairly. When indeed, I think identity politics was played from the very beginning. It's just that white folk didn't have to acknowledge the particular and specific roots of their identities, the specific norms that nourished their conception of self, the virtues that gave meaning to who they are as human beings. And therefore, those who are black and brown and red and yellow and indigenous and the like uh, have had to play a, a kind of catch-up game when indeed, uh, from the very beginning, identities were cherished. It's just that they didn't have to be named because they were universal. They didn't have to be talked about because they were presumed to be shared by most people in the society. And they didn't have to, in one sense, be ranked because at, until there was difference, until there was something to compare them to. And in our society, that's where we are for the last 50 years. Okay, thank you, Michael. John, I think what I hear from Michael is uh, not complete disagreement with your position, by the way, but an argument that in the longer run, over the longer haul, identity politics has a place and can be a winning strategy. So I'd like you to respond to that. Well, you know, what Professor Dyson is saying is drop wisdom without a doubt. However, with full understanding and full respect for what he's saying, I think that there's also a kind of idealism in it. And I don't mean in an idle sense, but I mean that the sorts of things that Professor Dyson is saying are ones that a lot of us are very used to hearing. And it's not that they're wrong, but they are highly idealist ideas of how human beings are to get along and to get ahead in the diverse societies that have existed, especially over about the past 10,000 years, when civilizations create societies that are multi-ethnic and absolutely inevitably stratigraphied. Inevitably, when you have groups of people coming together, some people are gonna have more power than others. Those relationships are gonna shift over the centuries. But the idea that we often hear that the conception of whiteness as default is unchallenged in the United States is one where it's one of those things where I'm not sure that we're always hearkening to the change that's actually happening on the ground. And so, so common it is these days, and this knows all level of education, is a white person who says, oh, that's so white. That's something that has penetrated the zeitgeist, really, especially over about the past 25 years. It'd be one thing to say in 1985 that people need to get past the idea that white is default. But the question is whether we can say that with the same degree of confidence now. Now, is there no racism? Of course there's racism. Is there still a sense in many quarters that, you know, Wonder Bread and white skin is somehow the real thing and then everything else is other? Of course. But the issue is degree. 
And I can guarantee you, and I'm getting old enough now to remember a different time. There was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when white people weren't walking around saying, oh, that's so white, and looking down on themselves a bit for not being brown people. And that's an indication of progress, more to the point. I think that there's an idea that this business of dismantling this sense of whiteness as default is somehow necessary to black people getting ahead. And I know how plausible that sounds. We hear it so often expressed with such passion and with such articulateness. But I'm not sure that it's the mic drop proposition that, and I don't mean that as a pun on Professor Dyson's name, but mic drop proposition that we often hear because this is what's going on. We black people are a group who have developed a tradition. It is a political tradition. It's an intellectual tradition. And now it's thought of as a moral imperative to stand before the people who don't see us as quite whole, who see us as other, who see us as a subgroup and say, stop looking down on me. Now, you expect them to jump and to do it. Nowadays, it's become especially fashionable to say, if you don't stop looking down on me, you're a racist. Basically means moral pervert. Stop looking down on me. And the question is, why does it matter so much? To be perfectly honest, I could not care less whether a white person doesn't see me as quite whole. And I felt that way long before I had had any success in life. To me, life is about a great many things. I'm an individual, and I don't mean that I'm not a black individual. But the question is, how perfect are we waiting for the world to be? So to stand before people and say, stop looking down on me or you're a moral pervert. If I put it that way, notice that it sounds like it's almost futile. You wonder whether it's going to work, as well just saying, give up your power, as opposed to very gradually working to take the power yourself. Give up your power, white people. Notice that it only ever works so well. And this is finally the thing. Let me bring this into the conversation. As, as you've said, we're speaking at something of a level of idealism. Um, but we've just come through an election, Michael, where... Um, President Trump actually picked up support among black men compared to last time in terms of his percentage of the vote, and also among Latino voters. What does that development have to say to the question that we're here to discuss about whether identity politics is a winning strategy or not? Well, I don't think we'd make too much of it. And I, I give kudos and, and do. And so um, he represents a particular viewpoint in this country that that in one sense, not that he would ever vote uh, for Donald Trump, but that is open to non-traditional alliances that might be forged and that might be revealed in the fact that there was an uptick in black people who voted uh, for Donald Trump. Only those people who don't know black culture and it's, you know, uh, differences, its internal schisms, uh, its dif disagreements, and its, if we can almost call it inherent moral conservatism, uh, would be surprised by that. It, I would argue, indeed, that the Republican Party writ large, in total, could have far more black votes, bodies, interests, and investments if it weren't for uh, lethal pockets of bigotry that outlaw the bodies of the black people whose hands might pull the levers uh, to, to validate and certify a, a conservative approach to life. So to put it bluntly, if there weren't so many racists uh, who were prominent within certain aspects of Republican ideology and politics, a lot more black people would support them. So there's no surprise in the uptick. But let me say this very briefly in response uh, to Professor McWhorter, McWhorter's claim about it's basically about see us. To a certain degree, I, I would suppose that would be the case. But for the most part, I think mature black people have lived their lives uh, without depending upon uh, the, the, the kind of support of white Americans uh, without the permission to exist. Otherwise, we wouldn't do anything. Uh, even in slavery, uh, when black people got passes on certain uh, plantations to go out and, and fish and hunt and visit their loved ones and go to church, uh, there was a kind of uh, willful autonomy carved out amidst the vicious brutality of white supremacy on the plantation. So black people have never begged white people for recognition, except in this sense, 
stop presenting obstacles to the full flourishing of our communities and the self-realization that is critical for a, 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 a robust conception of Americans' uh, identity. What do I mean? So it's not an individual thing. Hey, see us and let us do what we have to do. And as McWhorter says, then we'll seize the power to do it as opposed to asking you. Although Frederick Douglass said nobody ever gives it up. You got to seize the, you know, in one sense, he's Frederick Douglass like, right? You got to, you can't ask anybody. You got to seize the means. You got to take the power from them. But when it comes to the fact that their ideas about blackness have mo- not only moral support, but legal support, there's the problem, when they have the support of the state backing their beliefs so that apartheid was not simply an individual white belief about black bodies, it was the state and law that was organized against black people. So at that level, there was a back and forth between existential assertions and political realities. And that's what we're fighting for in identity politics. We're not seeing simply talking about the politics of recognition. We're talking about the politics of respect. Yes, we're talking about the politics of power and to share the resources that black people uh, and others are um, you know, certainly deserving of. John McGuire, I don't understand. I don't, okay, I don't go understand. Ahead. You, you go ahead, John. And the reason I don't understand is because it seems to me that the black community has certain needs that can be addressed in certain ways. And I don't see the relationship between the effort that we've been involved in, particularly in 2020, but it's been a long time coming, in teaching white Americans to think of black people differently. And that is something that a lot of people are putting an awful lot of effort into lately and have for a long time and making lives better, especially for poor black people. And it seems to me that there is a conception out there that in order to make life better, especially for poor black people, we do need to address black people as those who must feel a sense of their fist up like Malcolm X at the white hegemony. And I don't think that that is the way a critical mass of black voters feel to the extent that a great many very smart and well-intentioned writers do. And so what I'm saying is that if we're going to have an identity politics, what worries me about it is that there is a human tendency to suppose that you're going to mobilize people by calling certain people racist by pointing to the racist traditions, for example, of the past, which are very much there, unearthing subtler but still powerful racist currents in the present. And I'm not sure that's necessary if Black America basically needs four things. And these are the four. This is important. Black America needs four things. One, we need to stop the war on drugs. Two, we need to teach reading better. Three, we need to make long-acting reversible contraceptives available for free to all poor women. Four, we need to get past the idea that a legitimate American goes to four years of college and stress vocational education. Frankly, all four of those are it. And yes, I didn't mention the cops because there would be much less of a problem with the cops if there were no war on drugs and we emphasize vocational school more. That's it. Now, however you feel about those four things, I don't see how forging an identity politics and teaching people that the white man doesn't like you is necessary to doing that kind of on the ground work. And so I feel more Rustin-esque than Malcolm X-esque. I'm very concerned with making things better. But the identity issue strikes me as something that this is the terrible thing. And, and, And Dr. Dyson, I mean, Mike, I do not mean anything disrespectful, but Sometimes I find that view easy. It's easy to be angry at what white people have done, especially since they've done so much. But it's a different thing to get out on the ground and do what people who need help actually need to do. And I'm not sure that being angry at white people is what they need. Right. Look, I think that's, thank you for that. Uh, A couple of things. First of all, as you well know, the masses of black people are not consumed by anger. They're consumed by the desire to make life better for their people, for the people in their family, for the people in their communities. <clears throat> they are consumed utterly with trying to redirect resources so that they would uh, re- relieve them from marginalization and move people into mainstreams. Black people are fairly obsessed 
with every means available for uplift. Um, and if we are accused, rightfully so at some points, of excesses of respectability politics, the fact of their existence, um, as outlined by Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham in her book uh, about uh, Black women uh, involved in Baptist circles in the late 1800s, early 1900s, from which the term is derived, her book, Respectability Politics, it means that Black people are obsessed with the means by which they can participate in the broader circle of American uh, society, uh, gain access to the broader circle of American privilege, and to do so with hard work, uh, working harder than white folk. As you well know, Professor McWhorter, a common saying among Black people is you got to work twice as hard just to get involved in the game that many, in a way that many white people can take for granted. And so the reality is that black people understand the necessity for elbow grease. They understand the necessity for diligence and assiduity. They understand the need for applying their high intelligence to the problems at hand to make certain that they can overcome. That's their own. And if you go to any black church, and I've been an ordained Baptist minister for 40 some odd years, uh, what you hear in these black churches and these institutions of religious affiliation is that you got to do it and you got to use what God gave you to move forward. What's that in your hand, Moses? That's a rod. Use that rod to overcome. So I think it's a scandalous stereotype that is often applied to black people as if we don't already get and understand the necessity for hard work. And I dare say, when you talk about uh, the war on drugs, which has been devastating uh, to black America uh, and the like. When you talk about reading, literacy is critical, right, uh, to the perpetuation of a legacy of, uh, if you will, liberation and emancipation. And when you talk about, uh, I think you talked about, you know, th that four-year institutions are not the only ones uh, available and open uh, that will provide uh, uh, an elevator or an escalator, if you will, into uh, the middle class. That's extremely uh, that's extremely valuable for people who have been historically and systemically denied. And then also, of course, when we talk about uh, uh, contraceptives, I'm sure that might be the most controversial claim put forth. Uh, but what's interesting is that when we have arguments in this culture about access uh, to contraceptives and when we talk about the ability of people to make a choice and to have the the ability uh, to to terminate a pregnancy or move forward or to have family planning where it won't even become necessary, uh, that has been quite controversial. So at the end of the day for me, there is no question that black people believe all that stuff, but here's the problem. If you have, it's not about a, a stereotypical, oh, the white man ain't nothing and he's holding us back. I think that is a dis, uh, that does disservice to the sophisticated and nuanced, very complex arguments that black people have made. Black thinkers, black theorists, black intellectuals, black ministers and the like, mm -hmm. black professionals at a certain level uh, and people on the ground, by the way that there are barriers that prevent the flourishing. All we want is what everybody else has. My point simply is this, that there are enormous barriers that I'm afraid, Professor McWhorter, you may not be taking into full account. It is not the kind of politics of aggrievement that black people prosecute in the war against whiteness. It is the degree to which black people have been systemically denied opportunities that other people can take for granted. And as long as we deny the lethal limits that are imposed upon black American folk or black folk more broadly as a result of the very identities we speak about, then those identities have to be taken into account. Let me end by saying right, this. I actually, let me, I, let me, I, I, let me I, make this I, one final let, point. Let, let, let me make this let, one final wait, point. I, I'm sorry. So that, I, I'm sorry. I'm everybody sorry, has I, an identity. I, My Michael. point is everybody, white folk and everybody else have an identity. It's just that black people have made it explicit. I want to jump John, in I, because I, 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 I'd like to try to move to some other areas. And, but John, John, and so I, I will so, let you, John, I will let you respond. But my request okay. is going to be, can we try to be a little bit, a little bit more terse? And I'm saying that with respect because I have a few questions that I'd like to go to that anchor the conversation, will re-anchor the conversation in the question of electoral politics. But I understand and I'm hearing that the both of you have long experience with each other. And in a way, I've, I've never moderated a debate where I had to do so little because you're doing it so well on your own. But I'm just asking for terseness. Thank you. <laughs> I will be terse. Michael, you're misunderstanding my point, which is that I'm not saying that the Black community 
has a tendency to think of the white man getting me down and that's what we need to face. I'm saying that that's a problem with the black intelligentsia of which I am one. But I think that there is a gulf between what writerly and medially people tend to say on behalf of their fellow black people. And what exactly, as you say, the black minister, the black preacher, the black community activist often is thinking of. And when you talk about the racism that has been part of this country and still is, you're talking about these things in your signature way, which is that you are possibly the most articulate speaker on race in the past 100 years. But what that means is that you use the words with a certain power and goodness, they ring, they ring out. But I still say, and John, I'm almost done. I still say, I mentioned those four planks and anybody who's listening to this, rewind and listen to what they were. I don't see how white racism, be it overt or covert, stands in the way of a sustained push towards any of those things. And if we did all four of those things and Black America turned upside down in the generation, which it would, then I just question why we need to think so very much about the racism. There are barriers and they need to be taken away where they are there. But the four things I mentioned are such that we could do that work alongside while also turning black lives upside down. Let me break in in this. And my observation from outside this is that the two of you are now, you've staked your ground and you're somewhat circling each other, but to a degree where you're beginning to repeat the point you've made already. And I'd like to move forward with just putting this specific in front of you. We had candidate Joseph Biden pledge to nominate to the Supreme Court a black woman. Very, very specific appeal, it would appear, to identity politics. And I'd like to get each of your takes on that as a political gesture, what what it signifies to you. And Michael, you were you did not have the last word in the last round, so I'll start with you on that question. The fact that the now president-elect made this pledge very, very specifically, what is your take on it in the context of the topic that we're having in terms of did it help him get elected is an important, was an important thing for him to say? I think it was an extremely important thing to say. First of all, uh, I can't remember uh, any president being that uh, particular, that specific, uh, that overtly committed to a principle of, you know, racial justice seen as the fulfillment of an American dream. That is to say, that it wasn't simply a to a die. It wasn't a simply uh, capitulating to uh, forces that demanded a kind of politics of grievance. It was the recognition that the best route uh, to American redemption uh, went through those uh, powerful thickets of race, of gender, of class in this country, without which America uh, wouldn't be what it is today, both in terms of its most edifying elements and in its destructive and vitriolic expressions. So for me, uh, President Biden uh, did a powerful and wonderful thing by acknowledging the commitment of a constituency that happened to be black folk uh, to a particular party, uh, often unrecognized, often exploited within that party uh, to no good benefit uh, when it came to a certain, um, you know, uh, victories and certain uh, sorts of rewards for those victories that were achieved as a result of the black vote. So I think what he did uh, was was powerful, and I think what he did uh, is ultimately redemptive in that quite American sense. And John, what's your take on that? If there were a black woman on the Supreme Court, my heart would swell to bursting like the Grinch in the cartoon. I would think that was wonderful, just as I felt that way when Barack Obama was elected. I'm often called a conservative. I'm not one. I am a liberal circa 1960. I would fully understand the symbolism. I would fully understand the justice. But I worry, though, that if we're going to if this is going to be about identity politics, if that's our topic, then the problem is that often if the idea is that the most interesting thing and the most valuable thing about a black person is that they are not white and that they are therefore inherently disempowered, then we can often end up on a slippery slope of forgetting about the content of our character. And quite frankly, if President Biden, and I'm so happy to say those words, but if President Biden nominated a black woman to the Supreme Court who wasn't every bit 
the high achieving scholar and jurist that one expects a Supreme Court justice to be, then I would be extremely disappointed because that would be an insult to Professor Dyson, to me, and to all Black people in but terms why would, of why how intelligent... Because, why would he? Oh, well, for goodness sake, we have a culture where very often Black people are viewed because white people are told that this is the way they're supposed to view us as these symbols of racist oppression rather than as whole human beings. And so he might, his handlers might forget that the idea is to have a black woman who in her qualifications is equal to everyone else. I would have to see that they did that before my heart swelled. So I just have that caveat about it. As the demand for telemedicine grows, so does the need for connectivity. 5G meets that need. Qualcomm remains focused on giving doctors and patients superior, security-rich 5G connectivity. Learn more at qualcomm.com slash inventionage. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me just very briefly respond. Uh, absolutely, in terms of the swelling of hearts, uh, our hearts sing together. Perhaps the hallelujah chorus is appropriate to insert <laughs> here uh, for both of us. But, but, but see, that's the problem. The problem is that uh, Black people already having achieved not being recognized is the obstacle, the impediment, the barrier that prevents the recognition of high Black intelligence in the face of obdurate white resistance. For instance, if we now look at the Trump administration, the vast mediocrity, the horrible inferiority that was unleashed on this country has been little remarked upon in a consistently rigorous fashion that acknowledges that at the end of the day, perhaps one of the greatest victories of and, and triumphs of having uh, Donald Trump as president is that hopefully it will sound the death knell to the inherent superiority of whiteness, because this has been a relentless march toward mediocrity and mendacity. And the convergence of the two has resulted in the subversion of democracy in an especially, um, I think, horrible and in an especially terrorizing and in an especially terrifying fashion. On the other hand, uh, I agree with Professor McWhorter with this caveat to his caveat, uh, and perhaps we can have some caviar. The question is, <laughs> do we uh, do we often not acknowledge the pre-existing condition of black intelligence that is wiped aside, that res regardless of black people having high intelligence, regardless of black people making the grade, cutting muster, passing muster, or, or making the grade, we are consistently denied the opportunity to flourish in those particular precincts. So I think the, the 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 obvious thing is, let me give one very brief example. I was on a plane, two white women saw me, they had seen me on TV, and they knew, oh my God, this is a guy who speaks, you know, about race and 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 and, and gender. And so a white woman came over the loudspeaker. She was clearly the pilot. The two white women looked at me and said, Dr. Dyson, what do you think about that? And I pretended I didn't know. I said, What is that? And they kind of cutely nodded at the uh at the front of the plane where the pilot was. I said, Oh, a woman flying this plane? I tell you what. I'm so confident that they have they have ch checked her out so thoroughly she could probably fly this bird upside down and land on a dime and give you change. So I think the presumption is that those who make it through, like a McWhorter, uh, like others who do well in this culture, have shown keen intelligence, not the kind of condescension that some white people feel obligated to manifest in the face of black people, but the recognition that so much high quality has been ignored that it's it's about time that it finally gets integrated into the fabric of American consciousness. Did the election that we just come through point out that there may be an overgeneralization in use when the term Hispanic or Latino or Latinx is applied to the body politic? John McWhorter? Yes. And I say in half a sentence in response to what Professor Dyson just said, Nicole Hannah Jones Pulitzer. And I'll just leave it there. Brilliant but, woman. Great choice. <laughs> No, I think you misunderstand what I mean. That's the kind of condescension that I mean in that she was proven wrong about her central claim and yet given a prize like that and it's still- Ah, uh, but that was a look. look I'm so look. sorry to have to say that. But anyway, about the Latino issue, yes, we have um, a very large 
Latino group in the United States, and there's a great deal of diversity among them. And I think the time has passed when we can afford to think that Latinos are roughly those people who aren't white and aren't black and probably speak Spanish. There needs to be a more strategic approach to what a Latino person is. They themselves often don't feel like the one thing that they're often seen as from the outside. And so if one wants to have strategic voting coalitions, Yes, it's clear that this notion of there being a group of people that we used to call Hispanics who are all the same, it just isn't empirically suitable anymore. And let me briefly say to that, absolutely right. Um, are you talking about a white Cuban from Miami? Or are you speaking yeah, about a right, black right. Dominican from Washington Heights? Exactly, yeah. So that when you talk about the broad diversity uh, constituted within that rubric, Latinx, Latino, Hispanic, uh, as Professor McWhorter has indicated, there is broad diversity and complex heterogeneity that constitutes the beautiful um, and, uh, you know, mellifluous diversity of identities that can be collected under that umbrella. And hence, it's very difficult to try to predict electoral behavior of this uh, undifferentiated mass uh, called Latino. So I think it's especially necessary uh, to see those complicated diversities as it would be in application to black people. But let me very briefly say this in defense of Nicole Hannah-Jones. I would think that this is the higher standard to which some black people are held. There is no doubt. I, I have to do a timeout just for people who don't know what you're talking about. Take Two sentences to remind people right. of the 1619 Project. Nicole Hannah-Jones was uh, the lead figure uh, and editor behind the New York Times' 1619 Project, meant to memorialize and to rethink the position of Black people vis-a-vis -vis slavery uh, in American society 400 years after the first 20 souls were extracted from their rest in African soil and uh, brought here uh, to America in Jamestown uh, to serve as enslaved human beings. Thank and you. so the 1619 Project uh, is, that, is that effort. I will say this, that to me, Nicole Hannah-Jones deserves such extraordinary praise and that Pulitzer because she made 1619 totemic in a way, not in terms as an avatar of racial aggrievement or black protest, but as an acknowledgement that the history of America has been broadly written by people who have not paid sufficient attention uh, to the to the to the powerful impact of enslavement and in her suggestion that in the 13 colonies, the people who constituted what we now know as the United States of America might have considered race or specific, specifically enslavement uh, in their, um, if you will, uh, reflections on how to form a nation would seem to be obvious to many of us. And even those who oppose uh, what she has done have come to acknowledge that. But I'll say this that of course mistakes will be made and blindnesses will be had, but the overwhelming power of that project has been to situate 1619 as both discursively and intellectually and culturally as a moment to reckon with that that is a, a symbol of how the culture has refused to deal with that history. We history. need a separate debate about that, and I'm going I'm to leave it there. But yeah, I think that we should go back to, John, what was your next question before we run out of time? My next question regards the Democratic Party flipping Georgia, and whether that is an indication that an appeal to the identity of black voters there was decisive in that outcome. And the work that Stacey Abrams has done there, the former gubernatorial candidate uh, who did an enormous amount to register hundreds of thousands of voters, um, whether that is an example in terms of what we're talking about, identity politics as an electoral strategy, uh, is evidence that it's that it works or or not. So, uh, John, since uh, you are you gave me the pivot on that question, I'll take that question first to you. Um, oh, this that's a specific issue, and if the issue is that the Republicans have gone so low as to try to suppress the black vote out of a desire to have fewer Democrats voting and seeing that as the most pragmatic way to do it. Now, you can call this racist, you can call it pragmatic, you can call it both. But if that's what's going on, then naturally to say to black people in those districts, somebody is trying to keep you from voting. And frankly, to try to light a fire under people by saying that this is ominously similar to, and I know a lot of people say it's exactly the same, I don't think so, but ominously similar to what was going on before 1965, then 
religion, sure, bring on the sense of identity. But my issue is that you can't assume that those same people are going to vote with their identities on other issues, such as that President Biden can be argued to have some blood on his hands in terms of race in various ways we don't need to go into with our limited time. But it's Black women who were responsible for how far he ended up getting in the primaries, their sense being that their identity as Black subalterns would not completely decide their choice in who to put forward in the primaries. That's normal. And so I think we just need to understand that if there's going to be identity politics, sure, it can be used surgically, but it can't be seen as what Black America's voting story is always going to be, regardless of the issue, or we end up not getting things we need. Yeah, look, I I think that um, Georgia was an extraordinary example of the maturing of Black political power, the savvy that we can apply uh, to to adjudicating competing claims about what is fair and not. Here is a woman, Stacey Abrams, who lost, what, the gubernatorial race by, what, 60,000 votes there, by a man who was then the Secretary of State, now the governor, as they ran for governor. How unprincipled that might be uh, in the face of obvious concerns about justice. We can uh, we can leave for another day, but I think uh, manifestly so. But I think what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia is extraordinary. Yes, w- w- 500,000 people have been purged from the rolls, largely geared toward and aimed at African-American voters. The attempt to suppress the black vote was explicit. It was ruinous, and it was uh, a-, a rejection and a repudiation of the best ideals of American democratic processes small d. So Stacey Abrams went to work, not bitching, not complaining, not kvetching, but went to work on the ground, as Professor McWhorter talked about it, on the ground, got 500,000 people restored in terms of voting and added another 300,000 for good measure. Yes, the white suburbanites uh, in Georgia uh, came out finally, thank God. But the overwhelming white majority uh, in this country voted for Donald Trump. Most white people who voted voted for Donald Trump without the presence of a Jim Clyburn, uh, a, a black Democrat from South Carolina, and the expertise of and ingenuity of black women organizing and mobilizing around the country to help Georgia in its prospect of defeating the attempt to suppress the black vote, uh, Joe Biden would not now today be president of the United States of America. So it's not simply a matter of reflexive identity politics. It's about acknowledging a constituency that has been broadly the backbone of a party that has not often paid its rewards and acknowledged its contributions and finally is doing so. John, we're doing it. We're doing this conversation in in the midst of a pandemic in which it is clear that um, that communities of color are more vulnerable. There have been more deaths among uh, black and indigenous people than anyone else. And if you have a situation like that, does pointing it out and organizing a response around blackness make sense? Or does that, does that, does that offend your sense of identity politics in the way that you've described it? in this conversation so far. One of these willfully controversial black figures who doesn't like it when medical activity targets black people specifically because we need to get past race and that these sorts of things are sometimes dangerous because of the Tuskegee experiment by no means. No, if we're talking about an actual statistical tendency that's painfully clear, then of course we need to talk about race. My point is not this tired idea that we need to get past race and all be individuals, no. It's high too early for anything like that in any of the lifetimes of any of us here. That's not the point. It's not all about all of us are just individuals and stop thinking about skin color. That's corny. It's anti-empirical. And it would leave an awful lot of people in the lurch. To the extent that COVID affects Black people disproportionately, you have to think about it. And I'm dismayed by the occasional voices I hear that say that we're supposed to pretend that isn't true and talk only of class or we're supposed to massage the statistics more carefully than we ever would in any other situation. No, where racial disparities are real and where it's obvious what can be done to alleviate them, sure, we've got to think about race. I don't call that identity politics. I call that common sense. My problem is where we take identity politics into a vision of everybody who isn't Mitt Romney as the subaltern 
rowing with an oar down below decks on the ship. And we figure that that's going to determine their entire sense of who they are and what they're for. I'm afraid that that is true more of journalists and college professors, no offense, Professor Tyson, than it is of ordinary people. Um, When we think about uh, the, the, the dual pandemics, maybe there are three, maybe there's a triple pandemic. In the 90s, they talked about syndemics, the convergence of two, um, you know, simultaneous, um, you know, c- uh, pandemics, right? On the one hand, uh, COVID-19, and if we can uh, <laughs> fashion it, so perhaps COVID-16-19 in deference to uh, <laughs> what we had before. Um, uh, and good. Then maybe, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and how about this, COVID-2016, where we've just uh, recently, hopefully gotten rid of that virus and will be gone uh, January 20th. <laughs> but here's the point. Um, yes, uh, we must acknowledge the degree to which uh, some skepticism among black people about, you know, the vaccine or science and so on. And, and Professor McWhorter alluded uh, to the Tuskegee experiment. But black people are not afraid of science. They're afraid of scientists. They're not they're, they're afraid of those who make use of the science. Please don't mistake them for many of the inexplicably um, you know, conspiratorial white brothers and sisters who gather under the rubric of Trumpism, who are anti-science, who are anti-evidence, uh, who are anti uh, the rigorous application of hypotheses uh, to particular phenomena that we see in the world. And so African-American people, Black people more broadly, certainly suffer in disproportionate fashion from all of these pandemics. And don't they enjoy, or at least aren't they marked by a similar claim? On the one hand, pandemic uh, th- th- that is about a virus is about I can't breathe. It turns your lungs into sponge. Uh, the pandemic of police brutality uh, that we haven't spoken of much here that is real, that is powerful, uh, leads some black people like Eric Garner, like, uh, you know, Mr. Floyd, uh, George Floyd to say I can't breathe because of the uh, the vicious uh, denunciation of their very humanity in the case of Mr. Floyd beneath the knee of Derek Chauvin, who depressed pressed his already mortally, you know, severely asphyxiated column and it just choked him to death. So the point is that, yes, black people in this pandemic have to be acknowledged. The pre-existing conditions, some people would say, well, why don't black people get better health care? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question. We need access to better health care. Most black people use the emergency ward still as health care maintenance. By the time you get to the emergency ward, the disease is well developed and you're in bigger trouble. So I agree with Professor Mc water, that it is not only, uh, you know, about common sense that we should pay attention uh, to the disproportionate impact on African-American people in this country, but in that sense, uh, the politics of identity, of identifying and recognizing and acknowledging the specific manifestation of hurt and trauma in a particular community is not to do disservice to them, but to acknowledge them as worthy of being paid attention to in specific fashion so that their grievances, so that their hurts and their illnesses uh, can be relieved. I I don't see much daylight between the two of you on that particular question, Mm -hmm. therefore. But I want to bring to John, uh, as we wrap up, John, um, to bring this back to the topic of whether identity politics is uh, uh, beneficial to a party or an individual, a politician who practices them, do I understand your point to be that in a game where persuasion is important, persuading people to vote for a person or for something, that identity politics is going to be unappealing to white voters and therefore ultimately a losing game for those who practice them if you believe that the votes of whites are needed? Is that part of your argument or am I distorting what you're saying? Um, It's not something that I think about a whole lot, but to the extent that identity politics does tend in practice to involve a a demonization of something as amorphous as whiteness, to the point that, for example, these days we're being told that no matter what kind of white person you are, you are complicit in evil just by getting out of bed and not holding up a picket sign. That's tough. And yes, that is alienating increasing numbers of people and not just the white people, quote unquote, out there that we always talk about, which I think is a euphemism for don't have a BA. But it actually is now becoming regardless of education level. I see it in myriad ways. So to the extent that identity politics tends to be strident 
and accusatory and anti-white, yeah, I think that a significant number of people are getting tired of it. And it creates those people who jump the fence and vote for, you know, moronic baboons like Donald Trump out of a resentment at being looked down on. But on the other hand, I'm thinking just more of black people. If your visceral sense of what voting is supposed to be about is sticking your thumb down against white hegemony. If that's your guiding principle, the black vote is about not liking the white man, and getting the white man off of our necks, etc. You can think of George Floyd as a metaphor in that sense with the tragedy that happened to him. If that's the main thing, maybe it's not the only thing, but if that's the main thing you're thinking about, it can distract us from, frankly, the less theatrical sorts of things that really can make a massive difference in Black lives, such as please rewind and listen to my four points. I think that it makes us not have as much imagination as we might always have in trying to make Black lives better. And Michael, you've argued uh, throughout implicitly and at some points explicitly that identity politics is also played by white politicians playing to a white identity. So in that context, the question I, I, I put to John does alienating white voters through the practice of uh, of identity politics matter? Is there is your feeling a sort of yes, it matters, or is it so what? That doesn't really that's really not the central point here. Well, neither of those. I think first of all, before we get to that, we have to acknowledge that when identity politics favored white brothers and sisters because it was seen as universal and therefore normative and therefore American then there was never an issue. Uh, the great philosopher Beyonce Giselle Knowles said that uh, it has been said that racism is so American that when you challenge racism, it looks like you're challenging America. So to take off on uh, Beyonce's point there, uh, when you know W.E.B. Du Bois in 1903 in the souls of black folks said, look, I'm not trying to be bathed in an ocean of whiteness, neither and some people would be surprised that Du Bois said that, am I trying to enshrine my particular viewpoint as the sinquinon, uh, sinquinon of, of existence here for American citizenship? In other words, we're trying to come uh, to a position where we can acknowledge uh, the vibrant diversity and the, the, the beautiful heterogeneity of American identity, no matter how it comes at us. But there is no need to pretend that certain identities haven't been elevated and others have been uh, demoralized. Some have been uh, excessively rendered angelic and others have been rendered, uh, have been dehumanized. Uh, so that we can live in a culture where a 17 year old white kid uh, can shoot two people, by the way, two white people who are Black Lives Matter protesters in Wisconsin and get a pass. Um, the police don't check him. He gets to go back home in another state. Uh, recently, uh, $2 million was raised uh, for his bail uh, to get him out of jail. And, uh, you know, it is it is remarkable that the same protesters uh, who, who argue for uh, black inclusion in American society uh, are seen willy nilly by definition, not just those who are the exception who, quote, loot, but just by virtue of their protest are seen as people who need to be we need to get rid of because they are somehow challenging the fundamental propositions of American decency uh, and democracy. So for me, uh, white identity politics is nearly redundant. Uh, what we mean here is that the appeal to whiteness as the basis of identity is the practice of American culture. And what we have to do is to disentangle a certain conception of whiteness from a certain conception of politics and say that at the end of the day, if we are to have just politics, the degree to which we are able to recognize the historic legacy of inequality against black people because they were black, because the laws were invented um, in part to contain them. If the 1857 Roger B. Tawney, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, said that black people have no rights, that white people are bound to respect, that is legally entrenched. There is a jurisprudential rationality that is the predicate for the suppression of black humanity. 
That is different than the history of white struggle for self-recognition uh, in this culture. So, yeah, I think that sometimes acknowledging the hurts of white people is appropriate, of course. Uh, when you look at the newspapers and other studies that talk about the loss of white life, uh, and we, we don't even talk about whiteness uh, in terms of class. There's difference. There's a difference from being uh, from Kennebunkport, Maine, as opposed to Hope, Arkansas. So, yeah, we've got to acknowledge all of those differences. And I'll end by saying this. If white brothers and sisters could join black brothers and sisters and Latino and indigenous and so on and Asian brothers and sisters and recognize we got far more in common than we have apart that our common humanity, the bruises, the hurts, the offenses to which we are subject could engender in us a kind of politics of empathy that would take us much further than the, the denial of the humanity of the other. So that the manipulation of a Donald Trump figure would be greatly reduced because we would be invested instead in a beautiful simpatico that could be shared broadly uh, in the land. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, John. I, I want to thank you both as we wrap up this conversation for the way that you've conducted this. Um, it's our goal to to pursue discourse in a way that suggests there's an ability to listen to one another and to be civil. And uh, the, the two of you definitely did that. Starting from the beginning, where you told us that in a way you had so much in common and, and that you, you were willing to do this exercise, but you actually agree on a lot. And I would like to take one more. You, the two of you have been just terrible at being terse. So um, I want to I want to ask you just to give us a very, very brief wrap. I want to put this question to you, but I'm uh, and not I'm not asking you to dumb it down, but to be precise. Let me put it that way. I'm just wondering if you could share with us the thing that you said at the beginning that you you do agree on a lot. And I'd like to hear the main point of what that agreement is in as each of you perceives it. So John, where do you agree with your opponent in this conversation, Michael? In other words, where are you not really an opponent? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm I'm not a minister, I'm a I'm a podcaster and so I I I lack the mellifluous ability. But I would have to say that I, while I remain unconvinced that white people need to learn that they're not the default category before the black community can excel as a whole group, I think that Dr. Dyson and I have always agreed that there is definitely work to be done. Neither one of us are people who are interested in the idea of black people pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. Many people have often thought that was my position. I think it's getting to the point where people realize that that's not me. If anybody thinks that's me, they haven't read me in 15 years. and I wasn't even saying it then. So I think that we agree that work needs to be done. We just sometimes differ on what the pathway to the mountaintop might be. That was 42 seconds. That was really good. Michael, can I put the same question to you? Where do you basically feel that you and John McWhorter do agree? We appreciate the effort necessary to make this nation a better place. We agree that that effort, when engaged in with honesty and integrity, will result in a nation that will be far stronger and far better than being appealed to by the unmolested bigotry of a fascist president who refuses to acknowledge the humanity of all of its citizens. When we can move beyond that to an acknowledgement of our common humanity and our common decency, the world in which we live is a better place. On that, the two of you agree. I want to thank you, uh, John McWhorter and Michael Eric Dyson, for taking part in this conversation and for joining us in Intelligence Squared. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for having us. And I want to thank you, our audience, for tuning into this episode of Intelligence Squared. I hope you enjoyed it and learned from it as much as we did. And I want to let you know again that Intelligence Squared is a nonprofit that is generously funded by listeners like you and by the Rosencrantz Foundation. Clea Connor is our CEO. David Ariosto is head of editorial. Amy Kraft is chief of staff and leads production. Shea O'Mara is our consulting producer. Damon Whittemore is our radio engineer. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. And I'm your host, John Donvan. Thank you so much for joining us.